Hello, everybody. Welcome to this week's Pilates Hour. Really excited to be with you all. We had some really good responses and feedback uh, about the boomerang. <laughs> How do you do it? How do you teach it? How do you make it uh, accessible for people? And to me, it's one of those exercises that looks kind of fancy and challenging. And if you really have the body prepared, um, which is what we're going to talk about today, uh, it shouldn't be that hard to do. I can think of other exercises that are more, more challenging. So this is, it's kind of like a balancing act, the, uh, the boomerang. So what I thought we'd start with is doing a little bit of a look at it. And you guys have probably seen this before. This is Dov Cohen. He's one of our educators uh, originally from the US and now in Australia. And I thought, let's just look at it. Just to make sure everybody's on the same page, we're doing the same, <laughs> the same exercise. And you can see already several different exercises within this one exercise. So you can see the rollover, you can see there's the teaser just for a moment, you have spine stretch, and then all the related little bits and pieces of what makes up those core exercises. Let's go to our first slide and just take a look at some of the things that we need to be aware of, the what's, the what's needed. And I'm um, not sure if you guys, you know, remember from last time when we were looking at parakeet, but this is almost the same, <laughs> it's almost the same information. So um, we definitely need spine mobility. We have to have good hip mobility and control. And there's not a lot of movement of the legs, not a huge amount, but we do have to have good movement and then good control. And then the other piece of it is really looking at both the control, you, we could kind of say stability, but the control of the spine and of the pelvis. So we have the component of our thigh to our pelvis, and we have our pelvis to our torso or pelvis to our spine. And each one of those places has a bit of control needed and a bit of mobility needed and also a pretty good amount of awareness of where are you in space and how are you doing this? Um, so those are things that are really, really important. Kind of like what Brent says, if you're, if you wanted to be a lazy, what does he say? If you want to be a lazy physical therapist, if you just looked at ankle mobility, hip mobility, and thoracic spine mobility, you'd solve a whole lot of problems. Well, if you have this little trio of spine mobility, of good awareness from thigh to pelvis and good awareness from pelvis to um, pelvis to spine, you're going to be able to really master a lot of these higher level exercises. So there's a, it's, it's kind of fun. If you, can, if you prepare for one, you're going to be able to do many. I just put a list together. This list could go on and on and on of some of the related exercises. And you might be thinking, hmm, reverse abdominals. I'm not really sure how that fits in. We're gonna we're gonna talk about it. Um, o L R is open leg rocker. So I just uh, made it a little bit of an abbreviation there. And even something like elephant. If we start looking at the shape of the movement and the movement itself, we can start to see some of these similarities, even though it's either upside down or sideways or it's not the normal orientation. And of course, things like bridging and chest lift, those are integral anytime we are talking about spine mobility. So those are two that I that I really love. And I would I would say add in there, I didn't put it in prone press up um, or even a side stretch over the spine corrector where we're getting kind of a chest lift or a, a mobility in the in the upper part of the chest in lateral flexion or rotation, mobility, increased mobility in any direction is going to help increase mobility in any direction. So really you could add those, add those in there as well. Um, leg circles for the leg part of it, which then takes us into things like teaser, um, obviously the rolling from our whole family of the rolling exercises, 
Um, and then you can you know, pretty easily see things like short spine and rollover um, as part of that. So let's go to the next slide. All right. So when we talk about bridging, people talk about it as a spine mobility exercise, spine articulation, segmental mobility, all of these, these kind of buzz phrases that we hear. And the place for me that is really the most important is kind of the mid back area. So we're in that transition point from the lumbar spine up into the lower thoracic spine. That's a place on a lot of people that really doesn't have a lot of movement. We move a lot in our lower back. We move a lot in our neck, but that is a place that we don't often have a lot of movement if we're not practicing it every day. So I think bridging is one of those exercises that can target that area, especially when you're really thinking about the timing of it. So if we're just kind of rushing through and getting up into a bridge and the, the ribs are kind of open toward the ceiling and, and we're looking more like we're going to start going into a back bend, that's okay. There's nothing wrong with that, but it's not really going to help accomplish getting more mobility through the lower part of the rib cage and down and starting to transition toward the top of the lumbar area. Just like chest lift, now we can go up a few segments. Chest lift to me is so important for gaining mobility in the upper part of the rib cage. Um, and, it's, and it's a tough part. You've got your shoulder blades there, you've got the spine, you've got collarbones, you've got all these different structures and then thinking about all the ribs with that, there's, it seems also a little bit like it's might maybe a tough place to move because you have so many bony structures, but with that, remember, come all the different joints. So you have all of the thoracic joints, you have the rib to spine joints. So those are places where we actually can get little bits of mobility to then create a lot of overall or general mobility. So chest lift to me is, is just one of those that I think is crucial for everybody um, to do. And if you're not doing it when you're you know, going into extension over a small ball, like a Gertie ball or some of the um, like soccer ball sized balls, do that. It's a great modification. If somebody has low bone density, they can go into extension and then just come up to flat in their chest lift position, like a curl up, getting ready to go into any number of the supine um, mat exercises. But also for those that don't, who are going to continue to go up into flexion, it's a great way to, again, start moving more in all different directions. You can add rotation to it. Um, it's a really, really important movement. Not at all to me about conditioning the abdominal muscles, <laughs> although it does do that. Um, but for me, it's really an integral part of getting the mobility that we need in the upper in the upper back. Now, when we talk about the, you could think of it the roll up or roll down. Um, I really want to rename the Pilates mat exercise, the roll up or the roll down. I want to rename it to roll back because I think that the down sometimes gets us a little bit compressed. Um, but if you're just if you're at a place where you can sit, you can just be in your chair even, or if you wanted to sit on the floor and have your legs out in front of you, the moment that the exercise starts is from, if we're sitting up, is from the pelvis. So sometimes we think about the abdominal area, and we actually cue the abdominals first. So if I'm just sitting in my long sit position, getting ready to roll backward, um, I still hear things about pull in the belly, navel to spine. And you know, our, our approach to cueing is not to cue the muscles, but even if you were going to, you've missed a whole part of the body. You've missed the pelvis. And we have that big, you know, femur to pelvis, those big ball and socket joints. That's where the movement starts. So the pelvis is going to start to roll back first. And this is part of, and we'll look at it in a moment, part of the boomerang the pelvis rolls back. And that's really important because if my legs are outstretched and I roll my pelvis back, my hip flexors are lengthening a bit and then they can shorten as my legs are gonna go over. So that conditioning is really important. Um, the pelvis needs to move. And so 
any different rolled back exercise that you're going to do, maybe you're doing a roll down on the trap table, holding onto the springs, or you're sitting on the reformer doing the roll down series from um, sitting position, holding onto the ropes um, and to the handles. Maybe you're doing the short box work either on the reformer or on the ladder barrel. Any one of those things really consider the pelvis moving first. It's an important um, it's a, an important component that I think sometimes gets kind of missed. We just don't even think about the pelvis. It's all about the abdominal muscles, right? So that's something to, um, to think about for that. Now in the leg circle, and I was working with a group of students last night and we were playing around with this um, idea of not so much focusing on trunk stability, but focusing on hip mobility and thigh muscle length or extensibility or flexibility, however you want to think about it. So if you wanted to, if you were in a space and you're in your studio and you can lie down, you can give this a try, is to have one thigh pulled in and up to like you're pulling your knee into your armpit. When you open the knee out to the side, it's gonna give you a little bit of a counterbalance and you then can make these really large circles. And the part of the circle that's the most important if we're relating it to boomerang is where the leg comes back up because that's part of the motion as I roll back and roll over. Also really important for something like teaser, right? How do I condition my hip flexors where I can control my leg really easily, right? And we don't wanna just be using the quadriceps, right? We don't wanna use some of the, the helper hip flexors. We wanna use the iliopsoas. That's our main hip flexor. So that's something you can play around with. Focus on the mobility of the leg and the stability of the trunk will come along with it. So you can, you can play with that. Um, elephant, I love working on Elephant, um, you could also think of this for something like hamstring three, for um, hamstring two, some of the kneeling cats, is focusing on spine flexion as opposed to hip flexion. And a lot of times, and I was working with some students not too long ago, and we were working on tendon stretch. On, we happen to be on the chair, but you could also work um, this on the reformer is the initiation of coming back up and the pelvis, you know, and the whole body moving is I'm still hearing cues about sit bones to the ceiling or reach your tailbone up and back. And that's really promoting hip flexion, but we want to be in spine flexion. So how can you delay the pelvis moving? So now I actually want more out of the spine, um, different than when we were doing the roll down, um, sitting on the trap table or the mat exercise, is how can I create that idea of lift and total spine flexion? So think about your cueing when you're doing things like that, um, especially things like elephant and hamstring three. Uh, that would be something that's going to really help you get into more total spine flexion. So then this whole family, right? So rolling and seal and open leg rocker. Um, when you're doing it, I think we've become very goal oriented <laughs> over the last 10 or 15 years. And, you know, we talk about the journey and all of that. Is it the destination? Is it the journey? And for rolling, it, for me, it really is the journey. And it's not just about being able to roll back up and find your balance, but that's what's been focused on. Who cares what's happening while your body's rolling back and forth? Just make sure you get up, <laughs> you can sit back up toward the sit bones and show that you have control and command of this exercise. Yet when people are doing it, you often hear them, right, when they're doing the movement. And I think it's in an effort to get back up to sitting faster than they've actually let the whole movement that time to happen in. Like we're trying to rush the process. And I'm going to see, I wasn't going to be on the trap table here yet, but I want to just see if this will work 
I just want to show one thing. And again, you can, you're welcome to try this. Um, don't try the wrong one. The wrong one's not so, <laughs> not so fun. But um, in your rolling, if you've worked with me before, you know that we talk about using the backs of the legs so that you can use the leg to help you come back up. And then take your time returning go far enough over that you have a little bit of momentum to get you back up. And don't worry if you get all the way up or not. That's not important right now if we're thinking about these further along exercises. Go far enough and take your time because you know what it sounds like when you don't. When you rush to get back up, you can hear it and the back just kind of slaps down and we start to get the spine extensors in the movement. So just have that as a, as a consideration as you're working on um, these exercises with people. What is actually really important about this? Is it the balance at the end? A little bit, but is it also what's happening again, journey and destination, what's happening in the middle? So take your time with that. And maybe as a teacher, don't put so much focus on sitting and balancing, put a little bit more focus on the quality of movement as they're doing it, right? Um, and make sure that people really are getting far enough back up onto the shoulder area, not putting weight into the head, but the head is gonna touch the mat. I've seen a lot of people lately going so small that their head doesn't even get close to the floor. If you've prepared the body right with chest lift, if you really have good mobility up through the upper part of the rib cage and spine, they will have the capacity to roll over, be on the top of their shoulders and have the head free of weight or free from pressure because we, wouldn't, we don't wanna balance on the back of the head. So just have that in consideration as you're going into your um, your rolling and um, seal and open leg rocker and all of those things. Reverse abdominals. We are gonna. I'll show this in a moment, and this is where we are. Um, we're set up um, to start on the reformer. So sorry, I threw Melissa a curveball there. <laughs> as much as we rehearse, sometimes uh, you know you just got to go with the moment. So reverse abdominals. Um, I think of this a lot again as a hip flexor conditioning exercise. And the important thing, and I know I've mentioned this with other exercises, if you've um, tuned in, and I've talked about this before, um, is to, as a teacher, put your fingertips right at the hip flexor area. And if you're going a little more lateral and superficial, you shouldn't feel a lot of holding and tension, right? Obviously, those muscles are all working and they're all participating but it should be a little deeper up in the belly. If we think about how the muscle comes into the pelvis and up the spine, all the way up to the top of the lumbar spine, um, bottom of the thoracic spine, that's, that's our whole hip flexor complex. So we wanna feel that a little bit more. Use your cues like the widening of the sit bones and the bone rhythms to produce that movement with less tension and more just a fluid movement. So that's something um, that as teachers, we can, we can really work on that with our students. And I'm gonna show that in a variation um, in just a moment. I'm also gonna show um, mostly probably short spine, but in thinking about short and long spine, as a prep for this um, and how we can prepare our students for both of these exercises. How do I help somebody do short spine when that's the assisted rollover exercise that I want? And how do I progress that into doing something like teaser or, or um, boomerang while I'm still doing short spine? So again, different variations of it to make a difference later on. Um, uh, obviously the rest of the rollover exercises, those are super important, um, getting into things like jackknife and control balance and just the plain old rollover control balance on the reformer. And this idea of pressing the thighs up a little bit, people look at me sometimes like I have two or three heads when I say, 
you know, press your thighs up a little bit. And they think, well, if I press my thighs up in a rollover, I'm going to roll back down because that's the wrong. I want to be going toward my head, not back toward where I started. But if you do that feeling of pressing the thighs up just a little bit, not raising the feet, but just engaging the hip extensors just a tiny bit, you're going to find greater length in the spine and greater control, right? It still allows you to move with that little tiny bit of activity. And you will see people's positions change drastically where it's very kind of compressed or the hips are flexed a lot. Now we have the capacity to really flex the spine and keep the legs horizontal or parallel to the floor. All right, so that's the rollover. Um, and then in the um, teaser, the idea of space in the hip, and I use this idea, and this is actually a gyrotonic concept. I really try to give um, credit to wherever I've learned these things. And this idea of when you're moving in a joint, like your knee or your hip, um, you could even do it at your elbow if you wanted to practice it, if you've never done this with me before. If you had something at the joint space, right, behind your knee, at the hip flexor area of the hip, and you wanted to go around it, if it was something very fragile, like a bubble, right, could you make space on the inside of your elbow here and go around as opposed to just kind of squishing it? And the first couple of times, again, people think, oh my gosh, she's crazy. What is she talking about? Once you feel it though, it's an amazing awakening of stability in the, in the next set of joints. So when I do it at my arm, I feel my whole shoulder complex just kind of switches on a little bit. I feel the same thing when I do it at my knee, if I'm doing something like single leg kick, I feel all of my hip muscles kick on and just it's like um, uh, Brent talks about, and in yoga, we have the, the bandhas, right? So these co-contractions, it's not very much, but it's enough to have, again, that appropriate or dynamic stability somewhere that allows for more mobility somewhere else. That's a really important concept. So when you're doing teaser, imagine as the legs are lengthening, and coming up, it's less like the old gymnastics um, V-ups that we used to do, and more as if you were really moving the femur backward and around in the socket. So just some ideas um, to play around with with your, um, with your cueing. And of course, the seated balance piece is really important because that is part of boomerang. We want to be able to have the momentum, but then stop and then go into the spine stretch part. So really knowing where each person, each person is responsible for knowing, I suppose, um, where they need to be sitting on their pelvis so that they can balance without the spine going into extension for any long period of time. Those little wiggles are great. If you're there and you're trying to find your balance point and your body is searching for it, that's fantastic. That means that your whole system, your nervous system, the muscular system, everything is searching for this goal of, hmm, do I need to be a little farther back, a little farther forward? What do I do? So um, as teachers, I think we can give a lot of the responsibility back to our students. I don't have to know where the exact position is for all 10 people in my math class. I need to create an idea where they can then have that um, feeling. So. All right, well, let's get on the equipment a little bit. I'm gonna start on the reformer. In reverse abdominals, I mentioned the, the, the regular one that we, that we often do is just plain hip flexion. And just making sure everything is seen, yeah. So as we're there, be sure, this is, this is something really important again, how are you starting it for the client? How are they learning it? And then can you make it more challenging? In this exercise, please, please, please let your students and even in your own body get into this parallelogram shape, not with the shoulders directly over the wrists, but with the body leaning a little bit more forward. It's going to make a world of difference in creating more stability around the shoulder girdle 
that allows for me to have movement at my hip joint without any um, overdoing it. I'm just using the muscles enough to complete the task of pulling the carriage in and out. And it should have a little bit of a controlled, not quite a swing, not so much like scooter, but it should have a controlled movement back and forth that's really free flowing. So if you're seeing reverse abdominals and you're seeing people's expression and you're seeing them really pull hard, change something, either put them more forward, change the springs a little bit, do something so that they can get into the movement, but be efficient with it. Now, the variation, which is really nice, is to do this with spine flexion. And we do it. It's not anything I made up, but just as an idea to get into trunk flexion without so much hip flexion or hip flexor um, contribution or addition, right? So we want the hip flexors to stay out of it a little bit now, just for the feeling of it. And this is the same idea as something like elephant. The movement is not always that big. And it's not about me. I'm not trying to, you know, engage my abdominals. What I'm thinking about is actually trying to leave my legs almost behind. Like I'm, if my legs weren't even there and just get my spine to change shape. Okay. So you can work that in because that's an important part of all of these rollovers is being able to have control of the mobility to do it and then the control of the rollover or um, the spine flexion piece. So just some things to consider um, when you're teaching those exercises. And again, it's not just about the abdominals. <laughs> it's really about conditioning the body to be in these different in these different shapes. All right. So then. I was thinking about short spine and long spine and how I hear people ask often, oh, do I start my rollover um, and start lifting my pelvis when my feet are way over here or are my feet above me or are my feet over me and how much is the right amount? And it really <laughs> depends on are you teaching this movement to somebody for the very first time? They are now just starting to explore short spine or, or long spine, either one really. And you want to give them a little bit of the mechanical advantage to be successful. So if I want somebody to be able to roll over, but I leave their feet out here and ask them to start rolling over with their body, with their legs out here, most people can't do that. And so it's a little bit unfair to start somebody there. So let them start in a lot more hip flexion and learn how to roll over. So that'll be what this is going to, what this is going to look at. And I don't know if you guys will pick up <laughs> all the creaking of my old reformer, but it's, uh, it's quite, um, it's quite a tune that it plays when you use the straps. All right. So for a beginner, Again, I'm going to let them flex their hips quite a bit because I want the weight of their legs to be over their body, right? Again, it's a little bit of a mechanical advantage. So if my legs and the weight of my legs are over my torso, just naturally, my pelvis is already starting to lift. It's fine if the knees are bent, right? This is not so much about keeping the legs straight and having this great you know, hamstring flexibility. It's really about getting the weight of the legs over and then allowing the body to roll. So that's, that's how I approach the movement. Once I'm ready to take somebody farther and go into, um, into short spine with less hip flexion, thinking of doing things like boomerang and teaser, right? Now I am going to start from way out here, I'm now already starting to roll. You can do whatever ending you like. I love doing this bent leg roll down because it really does help people understand the spine mobility part of it 
including all the soft tissue. I have to say, as I've aged, <laughs> what I notice is that it feels like, you know, my, my fascia and my paraspinal muscles aren't so um, easily extensible. So this is another place where you can work on that. So just be clear with your students, is it better for them to do a hip flexion roll over or are they ready to do they're starting their rollover when their legs are a little bit farther away, right? Because that's part of what's going to happen in boomerang. And you guys can just try that and just see what, what is it like to do both of those. And sometimes, especially when you've been doing an exercise for a long time, you kind of forget, oh, you know, <laughs> this is how it is. So this is how everybody has to do it. But remember back when the very first time you tried something, how did that feel and what might have been helpful? You know, and this is with any exercise. All right, I'm going to move some things around. So talked about um, bridging and chest lift. And again, such important exercises to get into for the, the rollover piece um, when we're into that. Another piece that's important, and we're thinking again about teaser, is this idea of pushing through the sole of the foot. And if you think about any of these rollover exercises, could be boomerang, could be um, the plane rollover, or corkscrew, or any of those movements, we really get a point of where we need, it's almost immediate, like changing of where there's stability and where there's mobility, especially in the spine. So we have mobility at the hip joint. As we start to roll, the lower spine needs mobility, the upper spine and shoulder girdle need a little bit of stability. If this part is stable, this part can move. And as you're going into the movement, it's like movement, stability. Oh, now this one has to move. This one has to be stable. And it really is that subconscious control that we need to have. We can't be thinking about engaging certain muscles or um, any of that. It's, it's way beyond <laughs> what we can think about volitionally. So that's why the practice of all these things is so, is so important. So one of the things that in addition to that idea of space in the hip during teaser, one of the things that's really helpful is this idea of reaching or pressing through the legs. And again, this is a concept um, from gyrotonic that I just absolutely love. And it's the idea of the fifth line. Um, and it's and it is kind of thinking of the cross section of the leg and the center. Like, what is the center? And if you come to your foot, if you um, are a gyrotonic person or gyrokinesis, you know this well, it's more or less under where the ankle is. So under the talus, you can see the um, leg bones come down sitting on top of the talus and just kind of under that. I often describe it to clients as the place where the heel and the arch start to move into one another. It's where they change, you know, from one to the other. And that place is really a strong, energetic place that we can reach through during things like the teaser. And again, if I'm thinking about it going long first, and the, the mistake that people make often is over flexing the foot. It's not pulling your toes back as much as you can. It's just keeping the foot neutral, the ankle neutral, and sending energy there. So instead of it being a short motion here where I'm just kind of collapsing in my hip, I'm reaching long and going around. That's that idea um, that I was talking about earlier. So when you're doing things like teaser, really get into that feeling, start it way back when you're maybe doing something like single leg stretch, right? You can already be pushing and reaching through the foot to give you that sense of length. Very, very helpful. So let's actually get into a little bit of the boomerang and put some of these pieces together. This almost always makes me think <laughs> of Lolita. Um, We've added a little bit to it. I, you know, from the very beginning, um, I've learned it with almost like the dying swan um, feeling. If you um, are a swan lake person, you've seen this before um, of getting into 
the spine stretch shape and then the rolling back. And here's the moment where I could think immediately lift my legs up. And, and there are people that teach it that way, that almost from here, the body just starts to move and the legs pick up right away. That's great. But most people can't start there. They can't, they don't have the control to keep that position. Let them roll back a little bit. When they have balance between the weight of their legs and their torso, the legs will start to pick up on their own. So it'll naturally rock backwards. Once somebody feels that, then they can keep that shape a little bit deeper in hip flexion. But in the beginning, allow again the pelvis to roll back and then the legs to lift and you get into that shape of the rocking, okay? I was talking with Brent about the idea of why for some people, me in particular, it's easier to do some of these things with my legs crossed. Why is that? And we were talking about a few different things. A lot of times people talk about the just the adductor part of it, right? Your, your adductors are on, so that makes it easier. It probably plays a role, but I don't know if that's the only <laughs> the only reason. And one of the things we were talking about is, again, the idea of hip flexion and hip extensors working on both legs. So my bottom leg is pulling up. My top leg is pushing down a little bit. And what does that do to the movement? What does that do to help me be a little bit more stable in the thigh to pelvic connection? So things that we've been thinking about. So rolling back, I'm already thinking of reaching long and going around. I get into my shoulder stand change. And then as I roll, there's that moment where I want to keep my thighs away from my body. The other option would be drop. Now I'm short and my body is pulling in on itself. And I'm not going to be very successful at getting back up. Okay, so that's where you're going to push the thighs away just a little bit. Practice that in the roll up, um, uh, the rollover, and that will be then already automatically part of the person's movement. Here's your teaser, and there's your spine stretch. I love the arm circle to it. Um, and that's a timing piece as well of when, when do you circle the arms? And it's one of those pieces where if we don't have good control, not good <clears throat> muscular tension, but just good control, the arm circle could potentially bring us into extension. So how can we get the sense of control and I think of that as going back to things like rowing, right? If I'm working on some of the rowing exercises, I've got all of these pieces where I have a certain body position to hold and I've got to move my arms. So that's another piece that could um, be helpful with that. And Alice asks, um, in quadruped on the reformer, um, is the amount of flexion safe for clients with osteoporosis? Uh, I think probably not. Not so much um, that you're going into flexion because that could potentially be done safely, um, especially in the lower spine. But what I'd be more afraid of is kind of the valsalva or the holding of the breath and the compression that would probably accompany that motion, the reverse abdominals that I showed going into the flexed position. Um, I'd be, I'd be, I'd be wor not worried, but I'd be concerned that they're creating a little too much um, intra-abdominal or intra-thoracic pressure while they're doing it. So I would say probably not. I think there are other places that you can work on, you know, lumbar and low thoracic movements toward flexion that don't have that same that same risk. Um, so that that would be my answer on that. And, and again, of course, it would, you know, depends on the person and what spring setting you use. But I think on that one, the, the, the risk is probably 
a little bit more than I would want to um, invest in that movement and probably could do it some other different way. Um, great question though. Thank you for, thank you for asking that. Um, let's see. Ines is asking about a client with an L45 fusion and any recommendations or modification um, or completely avoid. <laughs> um, I would first check in with their, either their therapist or their, the therapist probably, not so much the physician, um, and see what, you know, see what that person thinks about it. If they had just one segment fused or the two, the two bones fused together at one level, I imagine if they have good mobility in the rest of their spine, good control and awareness, good hip mobility and control, I would think it would be possible for this person to do this. Now, answering this, of course, without seeing the person, <laughs> you know, I, I really can't give an answer on that because I don't know how this person moves. Um, but I would think that it would be potentially okay because a lot of us walk around with not a surgical fusion, right? Um, but with vertebrae that just don't move. So it would depend on the hardware and the, the way it was done and all of that. I'd have to ask their surgeon uh, or their um, therapist, but I would think it could potentially be okay. Maybe not the full um, movement, but some part of it, maybe something um, you know, where we have more assistance and things like that. So happily, um, you know, we can just check in with the, with whoever is working with that person. Um, all right, Kathleen, I create a channel. Oh yes, absolutely. I create a channel for the tailbone to be more comfortable for some clients. Um, what other tips do you have? I do the same thing. And of course I don't have my props here, um, with me, but, there are a lot of people that their tailbone, either from a fall or a fracture or just the way that it's shaped, their tailbone actually pushes out and is very uncomfortable when you're sitting um, kind of back on the sit bones or back behind the sit bones. And so I usually put two mats side by side and leave a little bit of space and create, you know, like you said, a little channel, a little place where the sides of the pelvis are supported more under the, under the sit bones and the sides of the buttocks. And that seems to work. Um, that seems to work great for people for any of these exercises. I've also done it with, uh, with um, clients, especially some of my young dancers who just don't have a lot of their, their spines and their, their entire back is pretty flat. They have the mobility to do the movement, but they don't have a lot of um, like muscular development in their, in their back muscles and their spine pretty much just touches, you know, the, the spinous processes are touching the mat in everything. Whereas some of us have a little bit more muscular um, development. We don't have that same connection. So I've done the same thing for people with that too, who, um, you know, really are bony and it's quite uncomfortable. So I don't know of another um, way to do it. I've just done that. And it seems to Seems to work great. All right, Yura. Clients with herniated discs um, in the cervical or lumbar spine, what do you recommend? Um, I <laughs> recommend that I don't give <laughs> too much information on this. It's kind of like the fusion one. It's, it's, it's out of my scope to say if it's appropriate or not. Um, and it depends a lot on if the person is symptomatic, right? Are they in some sort of a flare up? Is it is it more acute? Is it more chronic? And what bothers them? So again, a lot of people have disc herniations. If we went out and gave people, you know, MRIs who didn't have back pain, we would see that on the films it shows some disc herniation or disc bulge, but they don't have any symptoms, they don't have any pain or discomfort. So a lot of people have these things and move with them and live with them without any discomfort or any problem. So it, it's possible. Um, and it would depend on the client. Is it something they really need to do? Is it, um, is it putting too much stress in those areas? Does flexion bother them? 
Um, maybe flexion doesn't bother them. Maybe some other motion, uh, maybe carrying load or twisting is more bothersome. So we'd really have to evaluate each person individually and make sure that for any of these conditions, it's, it's the right movement for this person. Not so much looking at the diagnosis itself because the diagnosis is gonna present itself very differently in every single person that we encounter. Um, it, it, you've seen it, you, you, all, us as teachers, you have somebody who comes in with a complaint of something and they act a certain way with that. And then you have somebody come in with, which pretty much seems like the same complaint same either pathology or process that's going on and they react to it very, very differently. So there's so many things that filter into those things that we just have to be a little bit, um, you know, just really work with the individual and see how that, see how that goes. Um, all right, Kathleen, some of my hip bursitis clients do have an issue with the crossing of the legs and an increase in their symptoms. That's, yeah, that's, that's possible. Um, what would you do in that case? Is there a sequence that I could put in prior to minimize the symptoms? So um, definitely hip bursitis, it can, when you are putting the leg across the body, just the tension, the mechanical tension can sometimes be bothersome um, through the lateral part of the hip and thigh. Um, you know, I would maybe if I, I don't know, I'd have to think about it. <laughs> um, potentially, I mean, you could just do it with the legs together. So that's, that's easy. You don't have to, you don't have to cross. Although I, I do think there is some connection there that is, is, is helpful. Um, but maybe if you had some, if they did want to cross, I'm thinking of, could you have the legs cross, but not be so close together? I don't know. I'd have to think about how I would do that. I mean, the, I would just have them keep their legs side by side. And I think that would probably be fine. You're going to lose a little bit of the, um, that inner kind of inner leg connection, whether it's the hip flexors and extensors and the adductors, whatever that is. Um, but I, you know, you could do it, you could certainly do it that way. And then I just play around with what they're doing. And, the, and really with bursitis, the main, main, main thing that makes bursitis better is don't irritate it. Right. The bursa, those little sacs, they're very um, temperamental. <laughs> and so the best way to improve the symptoms and decrease the symptoms is not to irritate it in the first place. Um, so I would work on that if um, for any reason, like some soft tissue work around the rest of the thigh and hip. If that's helpful, maybe that's something they could do some uh, fascial release, um, things like that. Um, but really it's just anything that could potentially irritate us, make sure you're not, you know, not doing those things. So good. All right. Oh, cool. So Sandra, here's a, a great, um, and I don't think it went to everybody um, in the chat. Sandra said, I just tried the concept of moving around the joint in teaser and boomerang and the tip helps so much. Thank you. Oh, that's great. So I'm really happy that that works. I, I, I really want you guys to try these things out. And in trying them, you may you might find out this like, actually, well, that didn't work so much, but <laughs> I found this other way that this really helped. And that's really how, you know, I've kind of discovered all these things that I work on is just by not being able to do it, trying to figure out how to do it. And then something clicks. It's like, oh my gosh, that's the thing that really helps. And then I try it out with clients and they like it. And so, you know, there's hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of more different ideas. So glad those are working. And, and hopefully it does kind of get us to the point where we can, um, you know, find other things too. So um, I hope that you guys are finding these movement webinars helpful. We're getting some good feedback. If you have exercises that you would like to go over, let us know. What reformer exercises would you like to go over? What trap table exercises? What other mat exercises? Um, is there some great exercise on the chair that you want to review and go through? I love doing this stuff. So if you have uh, questions that you want answered, please let us know um, because we will happily do that. We're always looking for topics and we want it to be really relevant to what you want, not just to what I think is interesting, um, but what do you want um, with that? Okay, I'm seeing some. Now we're now we're going, okay, good. Pelvic press on the trap table. That's a fantastic one. 
Good. We could review the star on the reformer, teaser on the chair, snake. Ooh, good one. Yeah, snake and twist. And I love teaser on the chair. So Kathy, that'll be one that comes in for sure. Um, and Marina, yes, we can definitely do the star on the reformer. And Melissa was asking about the snake. So we can definitely do those. I would love to. Um, if you have others, just let us know. Let us know and we will put them in. Well, I hope you guys had a great time learning about the boomerang. And we really look forward to seeing you at all the other Pilates hours that we do. Um, keep checking back in and make sure again that you're you're signing up for them so that you can get the recording and tell your friends too. There's a lot of people who still, you know, different Pilates teachers who go, oh, wow, there's a free webinar every week. I didn't know anything about it. So share it with your colleagues. I've even shared it with my clients and the clients, you know, depending on the topic, they get a lot out of it. So share it as much as you can. And again, keep sending us ideas. Thank you, Melissa, for helping me out today. And you guys take care and we'll see you next week.